This is Startup Storefront. If you were born before a certain point in time, hearing about a good humor ice cream truck might conjure up nostalgic memories of a carefree summer. Younger generations might be more familiar with good humor products found in the freezer section of grocery stores all over the country. This is the story of how a single ice cream truck grew into a chain with national distribution, but it is not the good humor story. Our guest today is Ben Van Leeuwen, co-founder of Van Leeuwen Ice Cream. Ben's first experience with ice cream came from working in one of those good humor ice cream trucks, and his tale parallels theirs in many ways. He eventually branched off and created his own ice cream, selling it out of a truck on the streets of New York City before expanding into storefronts and grocery chains nationwide. But in order to get the full story, you'll have to listen in as we cover everything from why his vision for the company was massive from the get-go, the importance of mentorship, and why making good ice cream isn't rocket science. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Ben, the founder of Van Leeuwen. Thanks so much for joining. For the crazy amount of small people who don't know what your company is, please tell them, and then we'll jump right into it. We are called Van Leeuwen Ice Cream. We make ice cream in Brooklyn, New York, and sell it in our own scoop shops and grocery stores across the country. My wife wanted me to tell you that she is a top 5% on Uber Eats because she literally orders Van Leeuwen every night to the point of which I had to tell her, just order like 20 and then you don't have to order them every night and then they're in the freezer all the time. And so I'm excited to talk to you. You make an amazing product. Getting into the ice cream category is crazy. It's probably one of the hardest markets. And so I wanted just, just to get your take on did you start in the ice cream category? What made you want to jump in? What's your background? Just give us a sense of why ice cream. Sure. When I was 18 years old, I was finishing up high school, needed a summer job. And I responded to an ad in the newspaper for a good humor truck. I drove a good humor ice cream truck where I grew up in Connecticut for three okay. summers. And that was my foray into the ice cream business. Where in Connecticut did you grow up? I grew up in Riverside, Connecticut, part of Greenwich. And fast forward, I'm graduating from college. I need a job. I was walking around Manhattan and I saw Mr. Softy Truck and I thought, why don't we do really good ice cream with really good ingredients and sell it off of a truck? I thought it was a great idea because the overhead on a truck is gonna be fairly consistent whether you're in North Dakota or New York City very different than storefronts. So the vision was big right away. The vision was to have these trucks all over, to have hundreds then thousands of these trucks selling ice cream made with pistachios from Sicily and Michel Clazelle chocolate, which we used to use, and strawberries ripened in the sun in Oregon. And we quickly, about a year and a half, two years in, realized this truck model is so hard. Mm -hmm. It is so operationally mm -hmm. challenging and storefronts work a lot better. What was challenging from the truck perspective? Was it just the cost? Was it finding the right style? Was it the retrofit? Because we know there's a coffee truck literally right inside of our studio space that we put. I'm a real estate developer. And so we put a coffee truck that was right around the pandemic and we permanently parked it in the building, which now serves all these wonderful people on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. And I want to say they put about $120,000 into the retrofit but it's a beautiful 1957 French Citroen vehicle. But the problem was, and so just to give you like their example, if something breaks down, they're ordering parts from France and there's only one mechanic in Los Angeles that knows how to fix this, this vehicle, which does not make a good business. And so when you say on your side of it, the truck was kind of difficult, what, what was the part that you were kind of like, you couldn't get past or couldn't scale? A number of them. One, the regulation varies from town to town, city to city. The okay, permits you okay. need to run the truck, the permits you need to work on a truck. So in a store, we can hire someone and they can fill out their payroll paperwork and start working in two hours. In New York City, it takes someone eight to 12 months to get permitted to work on an ice cream truck. And I'm not exaggerating. If you have a brick and mortar storefront, almost no matter what, that storefront's going to be there every single day. In a truck, you need to find a parking spot. That storefront's right. gonna have electricity every day and it's gonna have water every day. On a truck, you need a working generator that's gonna break a lot and you need to make sure your water system's working, your water mm -hmm. tank's been filled, when it gets cold out that your water tanks aren't freezing. 
and then you have the space issue, right? You have very, very little space, which makes it hard to store stuff and harder to work in. Now, there's right. benefits to a truck too, right? It is a much lower cost to enter the business. I mean, we, we built our trucks for less than $30,000 and got on the road. I mean, we've always been, and we remain super duper scrappy. You know, we want to put money into places where it affects the customer's sensory experience. We were always really careful about how we spent money. Now, the hardest part about your business is getting the product right. And so how long were you in like R&D? How many different flavors did you try before you had like the bangers, let's say the eight that just made it great? Like what, how long did you spend there in that time of just R&D? We spent probably six months doing R&D. I mean, we, the R&D is never ending. I mean, literally we do R&D every single day on both new products, but also the the sort of less PR um, effect of R&D is just saying, how do we constantly work to make our staples like vanilla, honeycomb, chocolate, strawberry, pistachio, even better? You know, that stuff we don't market. We're just tweaking, constantly tweaking, saying, can we make this better? Can we change this source? Can we change the amount of eggs or milk powder to make it taste better? So early on, though, yeah, it was about, you know, six months or so to sort of get to a place where we thought this is really good, but our ice cream is better today than it was then. And I think in six years, in 10 years, it's going to be better and always get better. And, and yeah. when, I, when I say better, I also mean serving the, the sensory preference that the general market has, because that changes as well. You know, you have a background going before Van Leeuwen ice cream to good humor ice cream. But, you know, you're driving a truck. You're not actually making it yourself. And, you know, it comes already prepackaged and, and ready to go when you're serving it in a good humor truck. What was that like when you were first experimenting with all these flavors? I mean, you have no background in making ice cream. So what were your first couple of batches like? I mean, be honest, were they any good? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, making ice cream is easy. So the first batch I ever made, one of the cookbooks I owned was a Thomas Keller cookbook, Bouchon. There's a vanilla ice cream recipe in there, creme anglaise. I made it and I was shocked because I said, whoa, A, this was really easy. I mean, if you follow the directions and B, this is, at least for me, it's far better than anything truly I had had outside of, you know, I hadn't been to many fancy restaurants then. I was just a kid with very little money. So it's probably the best ice cream I, ever, I had ever had, and I made it myself. And I'm, I'm a good cook, but you know, I'm not a trained pastry chef. So I said, whoa, this is a really cool opening in the market. There's this product that isn't that hard to make. That's preserved state is also its serving state, so you don't need to do any preservatives. So that was the first batch I made. And what was different about that than say a Haagen-Dazs, which you know, I, I, I like Haagen-Dazs, it's, it's, it's not bad ice cream was the butter fat level and the amount of eggs. So there's a lot more fat and a lot more eggs. Um, and we steep whole vanilla beans, so that makes a difference too. But, you know, making good ice cream or making what we consider good ice cream isn't rocket science. Over the years, people say like, do you keep the recipe secret? We're like, no, like anyone can make it like this. They just have to spend a lot more money. I mean, we, we work to find efficiencies in places, again, which I was saying before, that don't affect the product. Um, so let's get really smart with our supply chain, with our fulfillment, so we can keep making an 18% butterfat, 6% egg yolk ice cream with cold ground, whole Tahitian vanilla beans, which is going to be what makes your experience awesome, you know? Because if the experience, when you strip all the marketing and away in the packaging design away from the product, if that experience isn't distinct, then honestly, I, I'd say I, I wouldn't want to be in this business. I wouldn't want to be doing what I'm doing. Because I do see, just to become a little negative, I see so many food products and new products, period, come onto the market where when you strip all of that away, there's no distinction from the competition. And to me, that is the most boring thing in the world. If I'm going to do that, I just want to go into banking. Is the hard part from your perspective, just like dealing with the, so you kind of mentioned this before, right? So you're dealing with like an evolving consumer where either everyone becomes sugar conscious all of a sudden or carb conscious all of a sudden, or the dairy market is moving into like the coffee shop here. They don't serve any dairy. It's all nut milks. And so you have this like consumer who's maybe trying to change or, or have you found it? It doesn't really matter actually. Like your product is so good or your customer is so loyal that you just keep pumping out the same thing making small refinements, but it's not like you're trading maybe sugar for like a stevia or do you do that? 
I mean, the goal is to serve the customer, right? I mean, I can make ice cream for myself, but that's not why I started Van Loo and I did to serve people. So it's listening to the customer. And I mean, we're still a relatively small company, so we don't have a consumer insights team. Um, you know, our consumer research is, is done by our sales team and our marketing team and, you know, our very small R&D team, but in a sort of undisciplined, intuitive, gut-driven way. So we, we do constantly want to just sort of try to get a sense of what they want and, and serve people more effectively, um, you know, with a goal of just making something that they want to eat more of. When you first started, how did you go about, did you just bootstrap this or did you, did you raise capital at some point? No, we, we bootstrapped it. We okay. started with $60,000 that we raised from friends, family, anyone we really knew who would invest. Um, that's all we could get. We wanted to raise more, but we couldn't get a penny more. Nobody sure. wanted to invest. Um, you know, a lot of, I guess most people just didn't believe in it. And I was surprised because it wasn't reinventing the wheel. I was like, I'm going to make really good ice cream and sell it off of a truck in one of the wealthiest cities on earth. I think this is going to work. So, yeah, so we went off that $60,000 for about eight years. Um, then we were able to get a small SBA loan, which allowed us to build a really our own sort of new manufacturing plant in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And we're still there today. We did a big renovation on that two years ago, right at the start of the pandemic. But since then, we've done a, in the last five years, we've done a Series A and then a Series B. You know, it's interesting, the point that you talked about before, where you said that a store is, is infinitely more manageable, but as a higher startup cost. And what you were able to raise when you were just starting out, because people didn't necessarily believe in the idea or whatnot, it seems like there there was no option at all to, to go into a storefront right away. But like knowing what you know now, do you still feel the same way that you would, if you had to do it all over again, would you start with a truck or would you go for a storefront and just try, you know, understand that you'd have to raise a little bit more capital? Yeah, I mean, if I had to do it, if I was doing it all over again, I would raise more money and open stores and I'd raise a lot more money. But if I was doing it all over again, you know, I'd have 15 years more experience than I had then. So I knew a lot more. Sure. I think for my experience at that time, a truck and $60,000 was a great way to start because yeah. I didn't have the experience to, sure, 250000 would have been better. But we, Pete, Laura, and I, my two business partners and I, didn't have the experience to take a few million dollars and deploy that smartly and successfully. We also hadn't honed the product, the retail experience, our team member training programs in a way that was ready for a lot of capital. The one thing that is a constant is every year that goes by, every two years that go by, goes by, if you're a growing business and you're working hard and motivated, you look back and say, wow, I can't believe we were doing it that way then. How did we not see this? How did we not know that we should have done it this way? So to us, that, that's kind of a, a fun phenomenon that occurs because we say we're improving. Yeah. So we know it's always going to change. But about three, four years ago when we started raising money, we felt we were in a place that was knowing that it would always evolve and continue to get better. We felt like we were in a place where we could really grow rapidly, where we had sort of brought the business model to a place that was ready to scale. Well, this provides an interesting segue. So you were on Deal or No Deal, not as a contestant, but as a mentor. And you know what, what you just said, like all the things that you, you wish you would have known now, if you had to do it all over again, you'd have 15 years of experience under your belt. The concept of mentorship is is just a, a fascinating one. In, in whatever you do in life, I think it's very necessary to both uh, have a mentor and to be a mentor when you get to that point. You were brought on to Deal or No Deal to mentor the contestant who was starting out her own ice cream business. And I'm curious to know your perspective on, on what being a mentor means to you and if you had a mentor uh, in your early developmental uh, entrepreneurial stages that, that kind of helped you along. You know, I had no mentor. I think it was probably, a co I didn't have a mentor because of a combination of like insecurity on my part, probably a little bit of arrogance, lack of network. You know, I found as, as I get older and more experienced in business, I realize how little I know for sure. 
You know, when we started Van Loon, which I think was a good thing, we knew exactly the way to make ice cream. We knew exactly the way to design a store. We knew exactly how everything should be. As every year passes, answers to anything and how anything should be to run a business successfully become less and less concrete. I mean, there's the constants of keep your team happy, keep your customers happy, right? But how to do that becomes more and more mysterious. And I, I think that's just, you know, humility as you get older. But then in terms of being a mentor, I'm not officially a mentor to anyone, but when I get emails or phone calls or texts from people um, who say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this, you know, can you help me? Um, you know, can I talk to you for an hour or two? I'm always happy to do it. And it, it, it's very selfish because I actually enjoy it. I like hearing about what they're doing. And, and it really is fun for me being able to hopefully impart some like lessons I've learned, quick tricks that you can do to avoid making bad decisions um, because I, I didn't have that. And I don't know if it would have, if, if it would have resonated with me had I had a mentor. Because when I talk to people who are, in an earlier stage of starting a business or haven't started yet, usually there's there's people who want to absorb and then there's people, and this is how I was, which is I think a less intelligent way to be, who just know exactly what they want to do and kind of just want to sit there and talk and tell you what they're going to do. And regardless of what you say, they're going to do it their way. And that's not a bad thing. They're going to do it their way. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to learn. But I was kind of like that. I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I think when I talked to people, I just wanted to tell them what I was going to do. And if they said, nah, that's a bad idea, you should try this, it would make me so upset. How many stores do you guys have today? We have 29 stores today. Okay. We're in West Hollywood. West Hollywood has, I think, the highest minimum wage in the United States at present. When it goes to running and opening your stores, what's the hard part? Like, is it is it labor? Is it the changing labor rates that make it harder to pencil? What's the, what's the thing that really is like, ugh, this is getting sticky? The hard part for us historically, which we've, we're in a really good place on now, but it was labor control. Beyond what the labor rate is, the margins in food retail are really thin. You know, right. so you might right. be looking at a 5 to 10%, mm -hmm. maybe 15% profit margin. So if your labor's over by like five, 10%, that could make the entire business model not work. And it's exactly. very, very easy for that to get out of control because labor control is, it's intuitive in one sense, right? If there's three people working and it's not busy in an ice cream shop, you kind of know that's too much, but it doesn't intuitively correct itself. So without really good management who's super on top of things, even if everyone has the best intention, you can easily be overstaffed. So labor control will make or break a retail business. And then the other part is obviously finding rent deals that make sense for the business. What we look at when we're considering real estate is we build P&Ls and then we do stress tests. So we say, we think this store is going to make $100 a year, but what happens if it only makes $50 a year? Are we in the red or are we still in the black? And we're actually very conservative in that way. So we like to go into stores where even under extremely stressful financial conditions, we can keep paying the team, we can keep paying our rent. And, you know, so far it's worked. Like we didn't close a single store even during the pandemic, let alone, you know, from the pandemic. So everything sure. stayed open and everything. I think there was a few months when we were in the red, but other than that, we were okay. It was hard, but, but we made it work. Has Uber Eats fundamentally changed your business or has just made it like a very, like a, yeah, it's been a lever for growth, I imagine. Yeah, it's been amazing. So, you know, Uber Eats, Caviar, Postmates, you know, every one sure. of the apps. It's just been absolutely awesome. I mean, not only for generating revenue on those platforms, but it's, it levels the playing field on building brand awareness, you know, in markets where, particularly vehicular markets like Los Angeles, where you don't have a lot of people walking around, we're getting exposure to a lot of people on the apps. Um, so they're trying us on the apps and then coming into the stores and discovering us. And I know a lot of business owners, and I see this on social media, complain about the 15 or 20% cut they take. If you spend 30 minutes doing a P&L, in looking into what it would cost for you to do that delivery aspect yourself, you are going to be right. so much higher than 20 points. So like for us, we're, we're really happy with those. 
as you closed your B round, is is the play here now? You have a model that works. It sounds like you have the efficiencies there. Uh, at least the retail model makes a lot of sense, or at least you understand it. Is is the play just stores, 100, 200 stores? Yeah, I mean, we do want to, we, we will and want to keep expanding the, the scoop shops. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't have a number. I can't say 100 or 200. I would love yeah. to do 200 um, if there's... 200 locations where there's demand for Van Leeuwen ice cream. I think there probably are, you know, close to that in the U.S. But we're also really focused on the the grocery channel, the CPG. There's a synergy between both of those channels. So sometimes people find us in a grocery store and then learn about the scoop shop and go there, or the reverse can happen as well. So we find that in markets where we have scoop shops, our grocery sales are higher. What grocery stores are you guys in right now? We are in Whole Foods, Sprouts, Target, Walmart, Hannaford, Meyer, Jewel, Safeway, Stop and Shop, ShopRite. All of them. <laughs> you lost me in the middle there. I'd never heard of some of those. It sounds like a lot. Our ACV is probably around 20%. So we're probably in okay. like 20% of U.S. stores. So, so it is a lot, but, you know, haagen and Ben & Jerry's are going to be in 99%. So... We're still small. And then the other thing to think about with doors is not only how many doors are you in, but how many SKUs, how many products do you have in each door? So we might say we're in, you know, we're in 200 doors and Haagen-Dazs is in 300, but we're in 200 with seven SKUs. Haagen-Dazs might be in 300 with 30 SKUs. So every door is an equal. Is the challenge then become like distribution and more? I know you mentioned your facilities in Brooklyn, but would you like that to be like one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast or how... How difficult is just the shipping of this? It's difficult. It's also really expensive. So I would define difficult as mistakes are made. You know, so when a pallet of vanilla is ordered, sometimes they send a pallet of honeycomb instead. Or when a mixed pallet is packed and it's sent to a retailer, you will get fined if there's even one case missing. So you'll get like a $500 fine for one case missing. So your costs on that can go up a lot. But since the pandemic, we've seen fulfillment costs almost double. So like truck from Utah to New Jersey, it's gone from 4,000 to 8,500. So huge cost increases there. Um, So we're actually in the process of- Why, why has that gone up? I don't know exactly why. I mean, I think labor shortage, fuel costs have gone up. Vehicle costs have gone up, so everything. And then the supply chain was backed up. But yeah, the the fulfillment costs have risen a lot. So our our scoop shops can absorb that because the margin's better. But in the grocery channel, you have to increase prices to absorb that. So we're we're about to do a really small increase. Almost all of our competitors are doing the same too. That makes sense. I have a question more as like a real estate developer side. And so we're entering this world that I call like the post-pandemic world. And so things have to change. And so, especially in Los Angeles. So if you were a business in Los Angeles, the government, because of the mass mandates, could shut you down. You were open one day, closed the next day. But you could have a, an ice cream shop in San Diego and be totally open. But in Los Angeles, you're not. And so there was this weird, like, how, you know, from a business perspective, staying alive becomes a problem. PPP loans come in, sure, but it's paperwork and annoying. And from a, it just, it doesn't work. It's hard. There's stress, there's friction. When it comes to how you think about just a retail strategy, does anything change? Does it become like more indoor, outdoor? Uh, are you thinking more about like garage doors in these markets or is it just, no, nah, we're, no. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the pandemic didn't change our, our retails, our scoop shop sort of location selection strategy, although it's except in one place, because the pandemic drove online delivery sales up so much, we do mm-hmm. sometimes consider the delivery opportunity in an area so okay. we actually haven't opened a store based on this yet but there might be an instance where we say we're actually going to do more delivery out of there because it's yeah. sort of a dead zone for our deliveries even if we think the walk-in's not going to be that good we haven't done it yet but we've talked about it so in that case you're basically just getting a bigger fridge is that kind of the play or is it just more of like there's no like indoor seating it's just basically it yeah. might be something like that yeah but we'd still always be open for walk-in like we're not we're we've never considered just doing just like fulfillment storefronts one thing i always order are cookies when i go into the store 
are you also in the cookie business? Is this going to become a growing thing for you? No. <laughs> we tried that many years ago when we, we used okay. to sell coffee in all of our stores because we wanted to, we wanted to de-seasonalize, make our business not seasonal. <laughs> So we tried yeah. to be a coffee business as well. And we actually opened our own pastry manufacturing facility and we used biodynamic flowers and made our own chocolate ganache and rolled our own croissant doughs out. And we made really, really good stuff, but we, it was a great lesson because we realized it's expensive, it's low margin, but it was also really hard to, no matter how well you do something else, it's hard to be more than one thing to people in the sort of quick service retail business. Um, you know, no matter how well you're doing the other thing, we were an ice cream shop. People yeah. came to Van Leeuwen to buy ice cream. You know, Blue Bottle Coffee, they go to Blue Bottle to get coffee. You know, I think if, if Blue Bottle started serving ice cream, and they actually served our vanilla for a time with affogados, but it just, it wasn't a fit for them either because th there's this friction in the consumer yeah. psychology of saying, wait, I don't go to Van Leeuwen for coffee. That's the ice cream shop. I'll say this much. I go to Van Leeuwen probably more for cookies than ice cream. My wife goes solely for the ice cream. I don't think she's ever touched a cookie or bought a cookie. What's on the agenda? What's next for, for the future of Van Leeuwen in this year, 2023? Continue to make good ice cream that makes you feel good. I mean, that's, that's kind of our tagline. And you know, what that means is constantly try to improve the product, constantly try to improve the team member experience, the customer experience, and expand. So sort of expand as much as there is demand for the expansion and as much as our capital can support and also sort of balance that in a way that all of our, our stakeholders, whether they be our team members, our investors are kind of on board with everything and feel really good about it. You know, with that in mind, you know, continuing to make good ice cream, I know that you guys made a Kraft mac and cheese flavor that kind of went viral. And I thought that was a great bit of marketing on your part, just because like when you're able to partner with a massive company to the publicity that you're going to get from people being initially grossed out by the idea. But then the, the feedback was generally good. Like, you know, people loved it. I, I'm curious about if you've got any other flavors up your sleeve that you are, are kind of like teasing out for a release in the future. We do. I don't, I, I think they're all quarantined right now. <laughs> That's a funny word for it. I will say with the shock flavors, with the flavors like the mac and cheese, we will never do a shock flavor for the sake of it being a shock flavor. We'll only make things that we think are delicious and that people will want to eat. Right. What really excited us about the mac and cheese was Kraft came to us and they said, do you want to do this together? And my initial reaction was, uh, I don't think we can do it because the label's probably not in line with our ingredient guardrails. We don't use palm oil. We don't use artificial coloring. And I looked at their label and I said, wow, you know, it's basically cultured milk, salt, and turmeric and an auto for coloring. So we said, this could work. And then we made it and we said, this is really good. And on top of that, it's not even weird tasting. If it wasn't orange, you'd just be like, oh, it's <laughs> maybe sort of vanilla, but a little bit tangy. So with those shock flavors, we want to do stuff that is shocking sometimes because it, 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 it's a good PR mechanism, right? Um, yes. And we're a small company with virtually no media budget, so we need to do stuff like that to get attention. But on the flip side, it was really sort of genuine to us in that, you know, Kraft Mac and Cheese was this iconic American product. And we love the juxtaposition of that in an artisanal brand, but also a huge part of our mission is we say make good ice cream for everybody. Artisanal food is easy to make. Making artisanal foods that in America that are accessible, both distribution wise and price wise is much more challenging. And that gets us really excited. And part of what inspired me to start this business was I took the profits from the Good Humor ice cream truck that I drove when I was 19 years old and I didn't go back to college and I traveled with a backpack around Europe and Southeast Asia by myself. And I was so, and I never really left the country, but I was so into the food when I was traveling. I was so like shocked by how good food in most of Europe and Southeast Asia was normal. The word foodie isn't a thing there. If you're in Italy, right you're a foodie, you care about where your olive oil is from and getting really good produce. So that idea of it being normal really excited me. Cause again, like, you know, doing a $300 tasting menu, like it's awesome. It's a cool experience, but like 
yeah, it better be amazing, right? right? But like being able to make something that's, you know, a pint for five or six bucks or a scoop for five bucks, which I know isn't, isn't cheap, but is, you know, accessible to a lot of people and making it a really awesome culinary experience to us, that that's the mission. And that's something that we'll like constantly strive for. What I was saying before, just constantly try to make that experience better, more distinct and just and memorable in a positive way for people. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite flavor? I mean, it changes every day, but this week, and it's been this for a year, it's the praline butter cake, um, followed oh. by the cherry chip. I have not had either one of those. Neither one of those is in the fridge at, the, at home at the time. I'll have to check these out. You know, I, I'm sure that you've experimented with a lot of different recipes, a lot of different flavors, and I'm sure that, you know, you have your mix of like those that, that just blow you away and those that, that you're just not too, too keen on. But have there any ever been any that just like, are really like awful, like truly, <laughs> truly bad that you're just like, oh, I can't believe this turned out as awful as it did. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't make awful flavors anymore because we've gotten really good at this. But in the early days, we were so militant in our sourcing and we wanted to make a licorice ice cream. Licorice ice cream is generally made with anise. You don't actually use licorice. Licorice is like a medicinal root that grows in the Himalayas. And I was like, no, we are using wild harvested licorice root. And I found an importer and we made this licorice infused flavor and, and it was terrible. It was absolutely awful. And around that same time, I, I made this one I really liked, but nobody else liked. I did a tarragon ice cream, which is actually good. And that is kind of licorice tasting. But then I also made a peach habanero sorbet, which everyone said tasted like salsa. So, so th those ones were kind of misses and people didn't want to eat them. Um, but then there's other flavors that we make that we absolutely love that just don't sell. So like an example is my, my business partners and I love passion fruit. It's also like quite an expensive flavor to make. Um, so we've tried like three passion fruits over the years, passion fruit cheesecake, passion fruit layer cake. We have a vegan passion fruit with chunks of blondie in it right now. And for whatever reason, those ones just don't move at all. When it comes to the vegan, the vegan category for you, what milks are you using? Is it almond milk? Is it oat milk? What do you go with? What's better for making ice cream? Because I know the consistencies can get really difficult between the three. Yeah, so, so with ice cream, we're looking for fat and solids. So we're using coconut cream, which is going to give us both fat and it's going to give us some non-fat solids. And then depending on the flavor, we'll also use like some oat milk that we make in house or cashew milk that we make in-house. Both sort of give a different texture, a different flavor. Um, and some customers love the cashew coconut, some love the oat coconut. But then to really bulk it up and give it that sort of fatty, rich taste that dairy has, we use um, cocoa butter, which is the fat from chocolate, actually. And then we'll also use raw extra virgin coconut oil. When it came to going down that road, was, was just shelf life uh, a challenge, though, since all of these milks can be temperamental or no 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 not at all because with ice cream it's okay. frozen so right. so you're, right. you're, you're, you're never you're having any shelf life issues yeah you'll see issues in ice cream with the supply chain if it gets hot and cold it will never go bad because it's never going to get that warm but you'll sometimes eat our ice cream or other brands of ice cream that through the supply chain have experienced what we call temperature shock and they might taste a little icy well, listen, Ben, anything else we should know? Anything else you want to tease about Van Leeuwen and what's, what's to come? You know, we're continuing to open stores this year in New York, Los Angeles, Philly, Denver, Dallas, Houston. And we're just, we're, we're excited to keep growing. And I hope I see some of the folks listening in the stores. would love to say hi. So thanks yeah. for having me yeah. on, guys. Yeah, of you course. Bet. Yeah. When you open the one in LA, let us know and we'll stop by. Absolutely. Stop by. Studio City's the next. So please do. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, Ben. I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for having me, guys. That was our conversation with Ben of Van Leeuwen Ice Cream. And since you're still here, please consider subscribing if you're not already. Or better yet, leave us a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you get your podcast. We are found at Startup Storefront on every social media platform, with the exception of Twitter, where we can be found at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.